This episode of The Corner Office is brought to you by Vistage Worldwide. In business for over 60 years, we exist solely to help high integrity leaders make great decisions that benefit their families, their businesses, and their communities. San Gabriel Valley. Thanks for joining us for another episode of From the Corner Office. The purpose of this show is to meet with some amazing current premier CEOs from San Gabriel Valley to provide insight and ideas to future CEOs and business leaders within our community. Today we're lucky enough to be with Phil Hedema from the Hedema Group who um, is the most recent Thea Award winner for Lifetime Achievement. Welcome, Phil. Thanks, Jack. Did I get that right? Yeah. All right, good deal, good deal. So thank you so much for joining us today. I think um, the first thing that I'd love to get from you is your story. How did you get into the Hedema Group? How did that all start? Well, the Hedema Group just hit its 15th anniversary. We started it 15 years ago, but my career really started 40 years ago. I'm a native Pasadena boy. I grew up here, and um, while I was growing up, you know, our family trips to Disneyland every year were like a highlight of something I really looked forward to. And I think the thought of being able to create those kind of worlds and experiences was something that really sparked my imagination. I never really believed that was a real job you could have or, or thought that was possible, and I was off making other plans. I was a music major and going to Cal State Long Beach, but I got a part-time job at Disneyland on the day I turned 18, and I've never looked back. They put me, uh, put me to work, um, and I really loved this world and the people that work in it and the creative things we get to do. Um, so that's where it all started. So I worked for Disney for about eight years, then liked it so much I thought, if I'm gonna keep doing this, I better figure out what I'm doing. And I quit my job and went back to Art Center and uh, was trained as a designer. And then left from there and did a lot of freelance work, worked on the Olympics in 1984 as the wow. pro- producer, uh, production supervisor rather for the opening and closing ceremonies, which was really a fantastic experience. Um, and then several other projects took me to Universal Studios here in Los Angeles. and. Um, I started working for them as a show producer and ended up being with Universal Theme Parks Worldwide for 14 years. For most of that time, was the senior vice president in charge of creative development for all of Universal's theme parks. Um, And I think maybe the thing I'm proudest of there was uh, I led the concept team on Islands of Adventure, which is their second big theme park in Orlando. Um, really? But worked all over the world in Japan and Spain and for the parks here and in uh, Orlando. Um, so after doing that for 14 years, then I set out on my own and started the Hedham Group here in Pasadena. And um, we've grown and grown, and now we're, we're about a 70 person um, production and design firm. We say that we create immersive experiences, and that could be anything from a theme park ride to a museum exhibit or. Uh, even the observatory at the World Trade Center in New York, which was our latest project. And I'm excited that I'm gonna be going there for Christmas, we're going home for Christmas, so I'm really excited to see that. Great. So experience, you you brought this up just a little bit, when you talk about experiential entertainment, Mm -hmm. theme parks, um, the observatory, say more about like what you look for in the perfect type of job. Well, we like to say we create stories you can touch. So we're, we're storytellers first and foremost. We like to create worlds that people can walk into and have a complete experience. Um, and that, again, can be anything from a theme park ride, um, but it can also be a theatrical show. It can be a museum exhibit. Basically, we're always telling stories. So we want to know who the audience we're telling that story to, how they're going to respond to it, what, what, what we're trying to get out of that. Is, is it an 
educational project or is it an entertainment-based project? Um, and it can be all of those things. It's why we love it so much, because we get to do a pretty wide variety of, of things. Um, so, and then we take it, we work with our clients to take it all the way from blue sky concept, what could it be in imagining that world, and then designing it, and then supervising the production and, and execution of it till opening day. Have you ever had one that has stuck out in your head as your your um, the, the one that the one that sticks out to you is the best? Yeah. I mean, I, I feel so lucky because I feel like I've had like a half a dozen of those more than anybody deserves to have in their lifetime. But the one I think I'm most especially proud of is. Um, a project we did for the National World War II Museum, mm -hmm. which is in New Orleans, Louisiana. Um, and we did a major theatrical show. It's a one hour experience. It's a big scale show. The screen, it, the stage it takes place on is 120 feet wide and 60 feet tall. Wow. It's got multiple layers of projection screens, moving sets, special effects. And it tells the story of World War II from Pearl Harbor all the way through the end of the conflict. Um, Tom Hanks was the executive producer. We worked with Tom. He narrates the whole experience. Um, and it's really a powerful and emotional um, recounting of that. So for a high school kid today who might not know all that much about World War II, it's a really great opening um, explanation of that. And then there's a whole museum that goes with that. That's sort of the portal experience there. Wow. And, and it's an experience that was really special to me because my dad was a World War II veteran who also grew up in Pasadena. Um, and uh, he's no longer with us, but he was, he was by my side through the whole development of this project and he got to be there on opening day. So to help tell his story a little bit was personally really satisfying as well. I would imagine that would be extremely special yeah. and something that you'll be able to hold on to for your lifetime. Yep. Absolutely. All right, so let's look, go to the other part. Um, so that was the one you were most proud of. Is there one that you were, you, it was sort of a misstep? We've all had missteps in uh, our lives. Well, I've had lots of those. Um, you know, I think, I think um, we, we tend to do projects that are always trying to push the boundaries and, and push the envelope a little bit. How can we use technology to do something nobody's ever done before or tell something in a unique way? And when you try and swing for the fences, sometimes you don't, it doesn't work out as well as it could. But um, um, I don't know that I want to uh, subject my poor clients to <laughs> talking about which ones were successful and which ones weren't. But um, I've definitely had projects, even when I was at Universal, where you know, we, we tried something and it just didn't work as well as we wanted to. The audience didn't respond to it. So when that happens, you just need to say, okay, let's look at this honestly and say, that didn't live up to our expectations. What can we do to change that? Can we, can we replace it? Can we make an alteration? Can we fix whatever's wrong? And um, that's part of what we do and it's part of the creative process. You know, nobody bats a thousand all the time. You're always trying to do something new, and as long as you can be honest with yourself and kind of um, really take in the reactions of other people and evaluate it honestly, um, you'll always keep getting better and better and better, and that's what we try and do. Right, yeah. and part of the reason I ask is when you think about if I'm a future business owner, a future CEO, or even someone who's trying to find a job, we all have things that happen that are learning experiences. And I think learning from someone like you that, you know, you're like, you know what, I had a messed up, these are the things I learned from it. That's exactly, that's. I, I don't think you ever get anywhere if you don't have those missteps. That's where, there's much more learning that comes from the mistakes than from the successes every time, you know. There was a pretty big project show I did at Universal. I'm not gonna say which one it was. Sure. But, you know, it really didn't perform the way we wanted to and I was worried my bosses were gonna fire me. I was really nervous about it. Um, but I went to them and we talked about it and I said, I really would, I'd really appreciate it if you'd give me the chance to try and fix this and they trusted me enough to do that and we worked through it and I really think the lessons I learned there, then I was able to take that forward and the next 12 jobs we did, you know, were much more successful because of I had that experience, and, and, and once you've had that kind of sting of, <laughs> of uh, uh, mishap, you sure don't want to go through that again. So you Never work extra hard to make sure it doesn't it, happen. Right? Right. Yeah. So. 
Um, so that would have been like a challenge that you overcame. Are there any other challenges that you've had along the way? Sure. Well, I'm a, I'm a sole owner of my business. I started it by myself 15 years ago. And frankly, I'm a, I'm a designer and creative type and I never had any business training. So had a lot of lessons to learn about organizing a business and the, you know, just the kind of the functioning of all that. And, you know, we have a lot of people on our payroll now. I've got 70 people. And there have been those weeks when it wasn't really clear how we were going to make payroll the next time because an invoice was late getting paid or whatever. And, you know, I lost a lot of sleep along the way figuring out how we were going to make that work. And you write the check and do what you have to do. Um, thankfully, it's all worked out. You know, I think any business is going to be a roller coaster, no right. matter what. And at the beginning, every time you go, you feel the highest highs and you feel the lowest lows pretty profoundly. Yeah. I've been doing this long enough now where even though it's still a roller coaster, I don't get quite as nervous about <laughs> it all because I kind of have a bigger long-term view of it. Right. Um, but um, yeah, you just have to put one, front, one foot in front of the other and figure out what are you going to do tomorrow. You know? what, who would be your biggest mentor, someone that you admire? Oh, boy, that is a great question. Um, I've actually had a, I've been so, so fortunate to have a lot of mentors. I think the one that maybe had the most specific influence in my life was a, a gentleman named Bob Yanni. Bob used to be the head of entertainment at Disneyland back in the 70s. He's the guy that invented the Main Street Electrical Parade, and he was in charge of all entertainment for the Disney company, um, all live entertainment. And I didn't even work for him at Disneyland. I worked in another division, but on, on his projects. And he loved to mentor young people, and he spotted me and treated me as if I was one of his employees, his direct reports, and uh, gave me advice, gave, sent me to classes, really believed in me. And I think um, the most significant thing any mentor can do for a young person is just to believe in them and to encourage them to say, you have the ability to do this. You can do it. I believe in you. And um, that just stuck with me my whole life. I actually ended up going to work for him later, and um, he really changed the course of my life. And, um, but you know, I, I don't think I've ever, I've tried never to go through any su significant period of my life without having a mentor I could talk to, somebody I could, you know, just without f fear of criticism or, and knowing I was going to get an honest take, I could go to them and talk about an issue I had and find, get, some, get some really good, solid advice. Feedback is that, important. That's something I think uh, is good advice for anybody that's starting a business. Absolutely, or starting even their career. Yeah. yeah. So bringing me to the next question. Mm -hmm. When you think about the, what the perfect employee looks like for you, what would that look like? What would get your attention? Um, there's a, there's, that's a really interesting question. What we tend to do is very multidisciplinary, too. We have artists, but they, we have architecture, we have engineering, and all of it overlaps. So um, most of the people that end up being with us for a long time have multidisciplinary capabilities, or at least they can understand a wide variety of things. So what I really look for in a new employee is a sense of curiosity and really interest in something beyond their little niche um, and an ability to listen and learn. You know, um, I, I want enthusiasm, but I don't want to know it all. You know, uh, there are a lot of kids that come out of the design schools that think, I got my diploma, I'm now qualified to do anything. Well, <laughs> none of us are at that point. Um, or even can, later. <laughs> yes, yes. So you can be really talented, but there's always something more to learn. So I look for people that are enthusiastic, but want to learn, are curious about what we do, show interest, and then are anxious to demonstrate that they can be of value. You know, it's, um, they need to be part of the team. They need to bring something um, beyond the, the black and white description of their job. They need to be looking at the whole project and making sure that we're always trying to do a better job and, and bring the team along on, on any project we do. Would that include someone who sees something that might help it, the project to become better? Absolutely, yeah. I think both, you know, um, in complex projects, communication is always critically important, too. So how well do they communicate ideas? And 
keep everybody notified of what's going on? Do they raise their hand when there's a challenge and they're not sure how something's going to get done? And do they jump in and help somebody else when they've got a problem? That kind of you know, attitude is as important as capabilities and knowledge. Um, and all of that goes together to make a really great team player employee, which is what we look for. We really pride ourselves at the Adam Group of having a culture where everybody works together um, and it's positive. We don't like drama. Um, you know, when there's a, a, ch a deadline or something, we all just need to jump in and get it done and support each other to do it. Um, it's it's uh, not very productive energy to kind of have too much, you know, uh, if we're arguing with each other or, or not supporting each other, um, our energy is not going into creating a great project, and that's what we need to be doing. So. And you probably are more tired when there's drama, oh, which yeah. is like the antithesis of productivity, yeah. right? Yeah. So if I am someone, and I'm going to give you two scenarios, someone who I'm, I'm in high school, ready to go on to college, how would I get into this type of industry? What, what do I need to do? And then the second part of it is um, maybe I was in my first career and I'm, I've decided, you know what, this isn't what I want to do. I want to try to get into something like the Hadama Group. Right. What would be the two tracks in order to, uh, to get into an organization such as yours well, I think or the industry? First, do your homework. Kind of understand what our industry is about. You know, um, Probably be somewhat familiar with even the theme parks, Disneyland, et cetera. And not just from a pure entertainment point of view, but look at them as an operation and as a business and have spent a little time thinking about that, understand what we do, and then understand how the talent and skill set you have might be able to be applied to that. Um, and then there are great, the TEA, which is our industry organization, has a great um, young um, professionals program to encourage networking. Um, so that's a great way to do it. Um, I think going out and talking to people without looking, before you're even ready to look for a job, just see if you can find somebody in a number of different companies and just go talk to them about what's going on. So you're really conscious and aware of what the opportunities are and how you might fit into that. And then sometimes it involves going out and getting a little more training to say, I'd be so much better at that if I could just learn more about some piece of it. And then I, then I have something to contribute. All we all want is to find people that can help make our projects and work better. So any employee that can offer that, there's going to be a real demand for that. Awesome. So, yeah. Awesome. Thank you for that. Um, let's talk a little bit about what's happening in your industry. And then I kind of want to hear about your award. <laughs> <laughs> So tell me a little bit about what's happening in the industry. What's exciting? I mean, uh, to me, I mean, just because this is so different than my yeah. scope of life, I mean, everything that you do is exciting. You're in the industry. When you think yeah. about futuristic and where you are currently. It's a super exciting time. I mean, you know, this industry really did start with um, the Disney company and Disneyland and, and Imagineering. And then it spread to Universal and as the industry grew and, and there were other entertainment things and, and the whole notion of immersive experiences became better understood, now the experience, the, 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 sorry, the industry has really grown to include um, educational, you know, museum work, et cetera. And that wasn't the case even 15 years ago. Um, it, you see our work in hospitals, you see it in, um, like I said, museums, you see it in retail stores, you see it in restaurants. It's really broad. Um, so there's lots of opportunities everywhere. And the industry is as big and as active as it has been. And now it's, it's international because as China's economy is growing and there's middle, middle class income there looking for entertainment, there's a real hunger for that kind of experience as well. So China's a big growth area. The Middle East has been a big growth area. So we're doing work all over the world on projects like that. So, um, it's, the industry is interesting because in the past and during economic cycles of the country, we often are doing better when the economic cycle hits bottom because, Why is that? well, traditionally, I think even during World War II, the movie industry, et cetera, did well because people are looking for an escape from the rest of the world. But sure. now I think it's even stronger than that because um, 
the industry is pretty good, the, uh, the economy is pretty good right now, but there's still a sense of optimism that there's such a need and a desire for this kind of experience. Personally, I think what it comes down to is we live in a really complex and media saturated environment. We're bombarded all the time. We all live with our face and our cell phones. But what people are most hungry for is personal connection with, what, with each other. And the experiences that we create are places I can go with my family, I can go with my friends, and we can experience that together. And it gives us something to talk about. It gives us a way to relate to each other and know each other better. And that's something people are very, very hungry for today. So I think that's contributed a lot to, to a real uh, demand in our industry. Interestingly enough. Sure. I mean, if you're walking around, it's very isolative yeah. the way we live right yeah. now, even though there's communication coming from everywhere. That's right. And we're on the threshold of some big technological breakthroughs. You know, everybody talks about virtual reality. Yeah. We actually don't think virtual reality is going to be that big of an impact because it's a solitary experience and you wear all this headgear and can't really see anybody else in it. But augmented reality, which is, or, or mixed reality, which is the next step up beyond that where I can sit here and see you and see it, something digital next to you, we think is going to be a mammoth breakthrough and really give us a whole new set of tools in our kit to play with and create experiences with. So that's very exciting and techno technology in the last 10 years has been just moving so fast it's hard to keep up with it and stay. And in sure. fact, our mantra is if we're designing experiences that only rely on the novelty of the technology, they're probably not going to be successful because they're sure to be obsolete within 18 months to 24 months. But if we're using that technology to tell a fantastic story in a dynamic way, even if the technology gets a little old, the story will still be a great one. And that lives forever. Wow. So, all right. So just my naivety. The Pokemon craze that mm -hmm. was a couple of years ago, is that augmented reality? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you've got people there, and yeah. yet there's a very Pokemon. Very rudimentary, yeah. yeah. That, but that was a very simple kind. So we're going to see big leaps and bounds in that. What do you, what do you see? Like, what, what would that look like to you? Well, I think, I think it may require still a pair of glasses or something, but you'll be able to walk into a room and um, have a celebrity you, you you know, you want to meet, walk into the room and see them there, or special effects, or the whole room picks up and flies to another part of the world. Huh. Uh, you know, any, virtually once we get to that point, anything will be possible, um, which is really exciting. You know, if you can imagine it, you're going to be able to, to build it and dream it. Wow. So. That's the world you live in. Yep. <laughs> How amazing. So tell me a little bit about the Theo Award. What was that about? Oh, well, uh, uh, I'm so like uh, kind of humbled and honored about this. The The awards are sort of the Oscars of the theme park business. Wow. Uh, they're given by the TEA. Uh, there's a jury that selects the awards. And every year, they give about 20 awards to the latest rides all over the world and theme parks, et cetera, museums that are really the best in environmental and experiential design. But they give one award every year, which is for lifetime achievement. And it's named for Buzz Price. Buzz Price was a legend of a guy who did the economic studies that told Walt Disney where he should build Disneyland in Anaheim, and also decided that Orlando was the right place to build Walt Disney World. And he went on to form an economics company that's legendary in the industry and kind of defined entertainment economics in, in the location-based entertainment world. And wow. I, I have, was privileged to know him, and that was 20 years ago. And every year they've given this award to someone else in the industry. And some of the people I admire most, Marty Sklar, that ran Imagineering for 50 years, um, uh, Ron Miziker, Keith James, these are names that mean a lot to me in our industry. Yeah. They're some of the leaders, so I feel just incredibly honored to have been selected to, to get the award this year. And, um, Congratulations. Yeah, it makes That's, me feel a little old, but. <laughs> you know, <laughs> you're, that it, yeah. but it's what an what a amazing opportunity yeah. for you. Yeah. yeah. What do you see, um, briefly for our last question, as an aspiration for you next? Um, well, I think there, I'm so lucky. I mean, I really have had more peak experiences in my life professionally than I ever would have dreamed or imagined. So um, I've kind of learned not to, not to hope, but the doors keep opening, and, and it's so fun to be able to explore 
uh, new projects when they come up. Um, but I also do want to spend some of my life giving back to the, this community that has given so much to me. You know, I'm a real supporter of our LA Philharmonic. I think it's the greatest orchestra in the world. I'm a music lover and love that. Uh, I'm on the board of an organization called Ryman Arts, which gives free art education to young people in Southern California. Oh, that's fantastic. Um, which is a fantastic organization that I'm really proud to be part of. So that opportunity to kind of take the fortune I've had and be able to give, give back and, uh, and also to bring young people into the industry. We, frankly, the industry is not as diverse as it needs to be. The stories we tell don't always reflect the, the, the people that are telling the stories, um, and they don't reflect the larger population, and we should. We sh um, so we want to bring more people into our uh, industry, and that's something else I'm working on as well. That would be starting young, right? Yeah, I mean, based well, on what we've talked about today, yeah, yeah. high school, junior high school, and how do you think you could do it? Well, definitely, um, I think in high school for sure we can we can do it. But I think first and foremost, if if uh, we like to open our doors to students, we do student groups all the time in our studio. Um, so, just and when they look around, they need to see people like them doing the work. So that's right. that's the best way to do it and to tell stories that everybody's interested in uh, and to show them that they could do this too when they grow up. So. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Phil, for coming in. What a pleasure it has been to talk to you today and to learn from you and to realize that I have no virtual reality in my life. <laughs> so thank you for bringing that. And thank you, everyone, for joining us today on our episode of From the Corner Office featuring Phil Hedema. I am excited about our next visit with you where we will have Christine Moore from Little, from Little Flower in Pasadena. Cheers to you and to a more profitable tomorrow. <laughs>